the first foundational step is to stop washing with soap or any of the little variations, the foaming cleansers, the gentle foaming cleansers, the blah, 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 the microplastic exfoliating beads, all that. It's just mm -hmm. got to go. And you want to take it back to the ancient practice of washing your face with oil. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Thanks for joining us on another episode of the Ancient Health Podcast. Super excited to have Dr. Motley with us today to co-host. And our guest is a incredible woman that is blazing a trail. She's the CEO and founder of Living Libations. If you are unfamiliar with this, ooh, let me tell you, Nadine is going to blow your mind with all that she knows about natural beauty. Uh, this company has such a range of products, but not just that. These mm -hmm. are products that um, are, are made from botanicals. And she really teaches through this platform about how we can really embrace beauty through nature. So I'm really excited to dive into that. She's also the author of Renegade Beauty, which is a book about, uh, really understanding these elements of nature and how they apply to your life and really looking at how we view beauty in general. So that's an industry that I know for a lot of women has relevance. So if you feel like maybe you're stuck in that cycle where you're going to the dermatologist and you're going to all of these different places where they're recommending peels and uh, different types of treatments and exfoliations and facials. And it's like, oh my gosh, this is like the most expensive thing that I'm now stuck in because I'm just trying to look, you know, at, if you're 40, you're trying to look 30 and like, this is the norm now. This mm -hmm. book is for you. Not only does she give you all of these DIYs and things that can really support you in your own home, she's really going to teach about beauty from a holistic perspective. So Nadine, thank you so much for joining us today. Dr. Motley, so glad to have you on the podcast. Hey. We're going to have a good time. We're going to have a good time. Welcome, Nadine. Thank, thank you, you so much. So good to be here. Yeah. Okay. So I, I would love to just start out because we always talk about botanicals and we talk about herbs. We love all of these things. Why are they the Holy grail when it comes to skincare? Mm. Well, I love the botanicals and essential oils are such a, a key component of that. And actually, yeah, when I first discovered them for myself, I was just like, wow, this is, it's just such a palette of a, they're just beautiful in and of themselves. We know a lot of the botanicals that smell really good. So there's that beautiful aromatic component, but they're all active in their own way. So one of the beautiful things about essential oils, when they're genuine and pure for, our, for a beauty ingredient, is that to varying degrees, they are all anti-inflammatory, antifungal, antiviral. Even if it's rose, you know, rose is 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 potent as, as clove in some of its antioxidant activity, but very different creatures in, mm. in what they can do for the skin, um, but both very useful. Um, clove definitely always needs to be diluted before use, just thought I'd say that. <laughs> um, but you have these beautiful um, ingredients that just one drop of a rose or frankincense or sea buckthorn oil contain over 500 different you know, and it's going to, again, vary. Some might have 800 or like, and there's going to be things that are yet to be discovered. But within one drop are hundreds of botanical constituents, active properties that can help with your circulation, help to break things down like cellulite, help to heal scars, get the skin cells in that area going. Sandalwood, geranium, they can help skin cells come back from moving down an abnormal pathway. Mm. So it can really bring beauty and order to the cells. Mm. So there's a physical component to the essential oils that even if you couldn't smell their beauty, they, you would be inhaling and those molecules would be just doing their work on your body or topically they'd be finding your you know, way into the skin. And so we you know, use those beautiful ingredients, which also help and act as, as ingredients that help to preserve the product as well. So when used properly, you can architect products that don't need to dip into the preservation, um, you know, the chemicals, like something like methylparaben, which may only be used at 0.01% in a formula, mm -hmm. which is minute, mm -hmm. but it's showing up and it's showing up in our tissues. It's showing up, for example, when they studied diseased breast tissue, there was 
um, parabens found in there. So even though things are, you, you know, chemicals may be used in minuscule amounts, I feel that every drop matters inside the bottle and what we're putting on our body because we already have enough to deal with, right? There's, you know, coal in the air, chlorine in the tap water, whatever. And so we, why apply things that are actually going to be uh, a detriment to our immune systems, to our liver, to our reproductive systems? And they're not doing really anything for your beauty anyway. It's only the chemicals might be doing like temporary plumping of, you know, so you might feel good for a moment. If you look in the mirror, you're moisturized, but you're really taking away from cellular function. Mm. So like the the parabens and the things they add into it are like additives that actually can give you like a temporary satisfaction, like the way you look, or I guess the way your skin appears, but you're talking about micro accumulation. So over time, that those things can actually build up in the tissue and actually cause more problems than they would actually help the skin. And it's not only those like the parabens, but you're saying like in health and beauty products, when you see, let's say I look at ingredients, and I'm the wrong person to ask, usually when we're talking about health and beauty products, but I'm asking for my patients too. So if you yeah. look at a, ingredients, like the people listening out there, we know that there's many things that they could put on um, on the ingredients. Are there yeah. some like the parabens? Are there some no nos? You say if you see something, even if it's in a quote a natural healthcare product, um, or if there's like certain types of dyes, are there certain ones that you say no, do not do that? Or if it's like if you can't pronounce it or know what it's about, then don't use it. Like, what's your standard or guideline when they're looking for something to use on their skin? Well, yeah, generally, if you can't pronounce it, don't use it. However, um, we have to include the Latin names on labels. So some people might, you know, like Santalum album is the Latin name for sandalwood. So that, you know, might throw some people off. But generally, just like that whole chemical realm, it's just like, no, just no, no, no. The parabens aren't going to necessarily do anything for your uh, like cosmetic appeal, so to speak, uh, but it, it helps to preserve a product and it's allowed in organic skincare. However, there are many ingredients that are seemingly natural, but aren't gonna be that good for your skin either. Well, and they are like peach kernel oil, um, almond oil, grapeseed oil, for example, those are totally natural, mm -hmm. but they're usually rancid. You know, oh, wow. Like I'm writing processed. this down. Yeah, yeah just rancid. I and we don't want to put saying. anything rancid on our bodies, right? Because then you're dealing with it. So then there's even like choices within the within pure. So things like jojoba, which I just love and have been using in my in my skincare since I was 18. Jojoba is actually a liquid wax, even though it's like it's liquid. So it looks it looks and feels like an oil as it is an oil, but it, it and if stored properly, it will last for a hundred years. What? Yeah. So rather than using something that's literally rancid as it comes, you know, out of processing and the processing of grapeseed and almond oil is not so pretty either. Yeah. And then you have to preserve those oils. Right. Because mm -hmm. then they're going rancid. Um, so there's those issues or something like glycerin, mm -hmm. which, you know, maybe OK is like a food thing sometimes. But when we're using it in uh, skincare or if, like toothpaste. So it's natural, like a natural toothpaste. Maybe it doesn't have sodium lauryl sulfate, which again, we don't want. So basically like no chemicals, just no. So, yeah, and no there's chemicals. thousands. And the word fragrance has like 200 chemicals in there. So it's like, it's deep, it's crazy. And it's just no. And then, so something like glycerin, which would be in your natural toothpaste from the health food store, it creates an invisible coating on the teeth that doesn't rinse away with just water. And when we go into the teeth or really mm -hmm. any system in the body, we know it respires. There's basically a inhalation and exhalation to kind of all living things. And mm -hmm. I, you know what I mean? So our yeah. skin has a respiration cycle. Our teeth literally, there's, there's actually, you know, there's a fluid that comes out of the teeth, which is a whole or deep, a deeper subject. There's a lymphatic fluid. Um, but that glycerin, which seems natural, will coat that and will inhibit that sort of breathability. Another example of glycerin, uh, it's in like KY jelly. So maybe the KY jelly seems sort of inert. It's clear, like it doesn't seem maybe that chemically. Mm -hmm. But when it's studied, what we understand is through the process of osmolarity, which is sort of like a thing you learn in like high school science, is though the cell 
because the outside of the cell, you've got the KY jelly, then the osmolarity will make that cell release its water to balance the water inside outside. So, mm -hmm. so what's happening, we don't even have to really think about osmolarity, but what's happening is that the cells, for example, inside the vagina with the, glycer the KY jelly mm -hmm. is when we look under the microscope, they're shriveling up. Wow. And they, one researcher, well, you said they looked like little cellular raisins. So so you're getting that temporary plumpness, you're getting that temporary lubrication, but really looking at a long-term drought where even it's causing the, the cells inside the vagina to slough off early before mm -hmm. their time and literally make the whole yoni more susceptible to STDs, for example. Wow. And that's a good example that's of, yeah. you know, it seems okay. But, you know, not to mention the yeast and the sugars that the KY jelly is creating in that environment as well, or affecting sperm motility. So yes. like, that's what I was asking, like was... one, yeah, one ingredient, and you can just see a whole rabbit hole of things that we don't want. So yeah, I think, would, yeah, go ahead. I think, I think, in, you know, that section of like, <laughs> wherever store you're at, just stay, steer clear. In fact, actually, most, you know, if you're like some type of pharmacy or you go to the grocery store and you're on the aisle and you know, because you can smell, you can smell all the fragrance coming from it. I like hold my breath. I'm like, guys, we're not going down that aisle because I can't handle the, I'll have like a chemical headache just walking through that one section. So that's just a giant, like cross that one off the list. It's canceled. Uh -huh. We're not going there. <laughs> what would you say uh -huh. then I would love, so this is interesting and I'm actually interested to see what your thoughts are too, Dr. Molly, because Recently, I have seen a number of people that are coming for all of the people in natural health. And they're they're even like advocating in large part for natural health, but saying that things like these essential oils are so harsh, they're harmful for the skin. And so you're actually creating more problems, you know, in inflaming the skin because we're taking something that's so potent, we're basically making an extract from it and then applying it. And now we're having, you know, potentially a, a greater reaction, poor reaction from the skin. Like, what are your thoughts around that? Because I feel like a lot of people are now saying, you know, and I, so I want to clear the confusion around that. Yeah, that, yeah, that is, gets confusing. The thing where you have to start with though, you have to start with a real genuine, authentic essential oil, mm -hmm. like which there, you know, which I mean, the games that are played in that industry are huge, right? I mean, for, is it true? Like, is it a fragrance oil? So there's even like just, which is, you know, created out of petroleum or in my book, I have a perfume on chapter and the new sort of Franken fumes that are made, like, because they're growing fragrance on E. coli. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a whole other wow. thing, right? So there's, so forget the synthetics and the petroleum. There's just this whole other realm. So there's that realm. And then there's just, adulterating and cutting and maybe part of it's natural maybe it's partly real peppermint but then they've made synthetic uh, menthol in there or um, maybe you thought you were getting melissa but it's some kind of like lemongrass situation so first genuine authentic essential oils and most on the market aren't are not right there's something going on some kind of adulteration um, and so that could cause and if they're used like that's going to cause burning on the skin or who knows what else because who knows what it is so there's that then there's also the you know using essential oils properly now most people in their skincare you're not going to be using things undiluted mm -hmm. so we're again we're not applying clove to just clove <laughs> just on our skin mm -hmm. um, and that would definitely be concentrated so there's sort of learning how to use them properly if you're using the straight up essential oils but what we're doing when they're distilled, you're distilling sort of this lifeblood of the plant mm. that actually you're taking away a lot of the um, things that, you know, would be like in a, not that there would be oxalates, for example, in essential oil, but you're, you're distilling it. So you're getting rid of sort of the, all the, the chemical, natural chemicals that, you know, mm. some can sometimes be hard for the body to digest. And by digestion, I mean, you know, through the mouth or through the skin, you know what mm. I mean? Sort of that mm. body's ability to interact with it. So that's really important. And um, yeah, once you're working with the real thing though, where you can go with essential oils is so exciting because they mm. truly are anti-inflammatory. Like you can, you know, 
get some like blue tansy and frankincense kind of combo and apply that to the ex- the rosacea because you're going to also be helping the mites because the rosacea is it's an inflammatory reaction on the skin and it's also an area where the microbiome of that area has has gone askew mm. and there are mites involved on a microscopic level and so that actually takes care of that um, where essential oils also come in is they're able to work with the microbiome and in a way that many of our modern um, skincare has these chemicals that are messing with the microbiome. Now, if you go to a dermatologist, you might be getting chemicals plus cortisone, chemicals plus antibiotics. Mm-hmm. And really no therapy for the skin should be including something that's going to mess with the skin's microbiome. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know if we need to talk about the microbiome for the minute. For a minute, I know your your people would probably know what that is, but there's a the gut microbiome, which I think a lot of us know about, the oral microbiome, obviously connected. And then the skin microbiome is a huge, obviously, area because our skin's so big. And the microbiome in your armpit is going to be definitely different than the one on the bottom of your foot, which is not very much activity. Mm-hmm. And it, as gross as it sounds, we kind of need to get out of the way and allow the bacteria to be our beautician. And so modern skincare is messing with that system where we're exfoliating off the top layer of our skin too early. We're actually removing far too many dead skin cells because the bacteria actually need some for food. Mm. You know, there's a, they, they're there to clean and keep the pores clean and feed off the sebum, which again, sounds like you got kind of a farm ecosystem on your face and you do. Mm-hmm. And it sounds kind of gross, but there's no way around mm-hmm. that. If we sterilize the skin, you know, we're going to literally, it's like trying to grow uh, vegetables in a sterile soil. So the great thing about essential oils, um, especially when we think of it uh, in regards to something like obviously skincare, but I love the example of oral care because there's a whole, you know, bustling bacteria in our mouths. Mm-hmm. You know, since the 40s, like we've been approaching agriculture, we've also been like kind of having that. Uh, scorched earth policy inside our mouths. We'll just use the harsh synthetic alcohol mouthwashes and the antibiotics. Meanwhile, those mouthwashes create more than 36,000 cases of oral cancer a year. So, because it's why it's like destroying the microbiome. Mm -hmm. So when we look at essential oils, um, which I use a lot in our dental care products, now we're seeing why for thousands of years, many ingredients like frankincense, clove, cardamom, tea tree, rose, mastic, like cinnamon, clove, all these juicy oils have been used for oral care. Now we know we have sort of the modern answer to that when we are looking at them under a microscope, because what we're seeing is essential oils have something called, um, oh my God, why am I forgetting that? Quorum, quorum, they're QSI, the quorum sensing inhibitors. Mm, so mm. pathogens in the body, they'll, they're sort of normally like individual free floating around like a plankton in the ocean mm-hmm. then when they the immune system's down they can start to gain traction through quorum sensing mm-hmm. which is how they can group up and gang and create biofilms and the essential oils inhibit that activity so in our mouths we're able to have things like clove clean up the pathogens but mm-hmm. work with the beneficial bacteria So they can clean up the pathogens without destroying the beneficial bacteria. And really, what other medicine do we really need right now? Like, that's it, Mm. where we can, so we don't have to have this like antibiotic approach. Again, those are good. They come in handy, but it's in the supply. They've been overused, overprescribed. Milk contains uh, the allowable limits of tetracycline in a classic milk is is out of control. Mm -hmm. So we're having uh, issues where there's antibiotic resistance. And so even essential oils are used in like chicken feed, for example, in Europe, because instead of antibiotics, because now they're able to see like adding oregano to the feed is helping on a larger scale commercial farming. So that's one reason why I love essential oils. (laughs) I love that. That was good. I'm not kidding. I'm needing like when we were talking about how the skin will allow certain bacteria, like you say, like it's farmland, uh, that how it feeds off the dead skin Um, in Mm -hmm. the office at many times. Like when we look at like we do a lot of acupuncture in the in the office and we I always approach infection states 
I hope I do similarly, that whenever you find an area of the body that has a higher amount of infection, let's say there's a lot of strep. Let's say there's a lot of staph aureus on the skin. The first response to most of our culture is to say, let's kill it, like you just said, and clean it off. But bacteria, as you have seen, because you studied it, like when you look at bacteria and mold in nature, their job is to break down. Mm -hmm. So I have to look at a bacterial infection like, A, do you want to clean it out? Or B, is it trying to clean up something in the organ that it's showing up in? Right. I don't know. So I have to investigate further to figure out, is there a toxin, a metallic element, a plastic or something that could be in the tissue that the, the bacteria or even a parasite is trying to go after? Right. So everybody's like, well, cleanse it, get it out of the way. I'm like, I, I can't say that because there's a natural ecosystem that's going on. And so it's always about, like you talked about, encouraging the strength of the mm -hmm. organ, encouraging strength of the good bacteria. They'll work it out usually. So yes. instead of killing it off, you're like, well, I'm going to encourage the strength of this kind of bacteria to help with the expression of the body physically. Because we always say in Chinese medicine, they go, well, your skin shows. They always tell us, look at the lungs. Yeah. Look at the lungs because the lungs are created from our endoderm, ectoderm, mesoderm. So they say we come from three types of cells. So in Chinese medicine, if the lungs are affected, we know that the whole digestive system is haywire somewhere. So mm -hmm. if it comes out in the skin, that ecosystem, I usually try to find if the large intestines go on, you know, haywire or going off with essential oils. But I found is, uh, Courtney, that you, you suggest like, what do I see with essential oils? Sometimes, Nadine, do you see this? And Courtney, too, when you put something on a person to help with a certain condition, I find like, man, that worked amazing. And then other times, like, it didn't give me the traction I thought it would. And I have to believe, like you just said, that the microbiome, that internal ecosystem, what if bioindividuality is taking place? Like this person can use this oil to help their ecosystem out. And this other person said, I really don't need that right now. And I'm going to use it differently. That's some of the challenges I have in the office at times, because I love the way that essential oil. So I always have to choose different oils and hopefully it works. But sometimes I find the yeah. most odd ones to work for people because of their biome. Sense. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. And the, the great thing is there's choices within the oil family, right? Like you're yeah. like, oh, that one didn't work. So I can go to this one. Like we have 10 types of frankincense, for example. What? So, it's, oh, I love. When you, when you do the, like all the, you said the constituents, all those things within the yeah. oil and like you have in your own standards, do you yeah. have as a person going out to get some oils, you know, you want the pure form of oil. My, one of my questions would be when you look at an oil label, like, are there some things you just try to look for in an essential oil saying this is a, a decent product or, you know, because I know there's so many products out there and so many companies, but is there like a couple of things that you say these are good standards to for the yes, listeners yeah. out there well, to go for? First, I would always like build up your scent library, like which is just you and your nose. So, you know, smell the not good oils, too. So you have the scent reference in there because mm -hmm. also, you know, you'll smell maybe a peppermint and it'll just that smells like candy cane. So it is. But then when you smell the real peppermints, they don't hit you over the head in the same way. Mm. And, it, it, you know, it smells like peppermint, but not like a candy cane. Because, of course, that's used, candy canes use menthol, which is a synthetic version of oh. peppermint. That, you know what I mean? So there's those subtleties. Yep. And then, uh, yeah, you want to look for um, the, when you're buying the oil, at least it should have what part of the plant was distilled. Is it the root? Is it the leaf? Is it the resin? I mean, certain plants, it can only be like the frankincense. It's only going to be the resin, Hope, you know, so it shouldn't say the root. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and the Latin name is very important because, you know, again, for variety, wh what country was it grown in? So many, many countries grow lavender, mm -hmm. but like then there's something which is, I think, was it Rupert Sheldrake that this called this thing called the morphogenic field, which mm -hmm. is sort of the, everything else, the sort of history and the resonance of where the thing is growing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's California lavender. But I'm going to really prefer just the morphogenic field, so to speak, yeah. of the Bulgarian or the French lavenders. There's a history there that I love and tapping into that. So you'll learn about, you know, where it, where it grew, what part, the Latin name. I mean, that should be, a, a you know, at least a minimum. And then we also include uh, lab tests. So yes. we do we send everything out to like a, a third party lab and then just put those up as well. So people can really get to know. And then what's cool about that is then you're seeing all the constituents in the oils and stuff. 
you know, a lot of us don't fully know what that means, but it's, they're fun to look at and you've got to pick out all these, uh, you know, things, totally like, properties. yeah, with the, um, I think with the morphogenic fields, like individuals would say, what would you mean by that? But essential oils are such big carriers of frequency that yeah. it depends about which area it was grown in. Is that where you're con- uh, like, yeah, that's totally what it feels like. Like a miasma, a miam is a genetic predisposition for a country or a culture or a family to carry a specific infection in homeopathy. Mm-hmm. So they yeah. say that the area that the plant was grown in can carry the energy of the attitude or the genetic traits of that particular uh, country. So different countries have different miasms. Some have more tuberculosis, some more have like syphilis. They all have different ones. So um, when you talk about it, okay, so I saw this report, Nadine, where this farmer – you guys may have seen this. Like when we talk morphogenic fields, all the farms around him just grew with everything with different pesticides and such. But he found out like the frequencies of birds mm-hmm. and he found that frequencies of birds would actually, when a bird sings, certain components of the plant actually opens up. So it tells the plant when mm-hmm. to start transferring water back and forth between itself and the earth. That so the sound sense. of the birds. So he said that same frequency is the same frequency that you find in classical music at certain notes. Mm-hmm. So he started playing classical music across his fields. And he found that his plants would grow like 15 feet wow. and he would like grow more squash, four to six more squash on his plants just because he played the music over them. So I'm saying morphogenic fields, people think where you get your essential oil means a lot. It's like, it definitely does. Cause you can shape, you can change the polar bonds within the oil to carry certain tones and frequencies. I'm sorry. I went on this whole rabbit trail, Courtney. I'm sorry about, but <laughs> when we talk about morphogenic fields, it does, it is the attitude, like how you resonate. Like you said, find your set, like finding the type of oil that resonates with you. And mm-hmm. I think you'll resonate, even if it's like three different lavenders, but why does one pick, you pick one over the other? That's a great point. Ah. Yeah. So anyway, Courtney, go ahead. So good. I, I, you know, first of all, the things that you read and the stuff that, you know, it always, <laughs> it never ceases to amaze me. I'm like, where does that come from? But I'm glad that you're out there doing the work of the Lord and making us all a little bit smarter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I'm glad you're out there, Chris. Thanks. Yeah, th- thank that, you for being the one to find all this glad information you <laughs> and share it with us. We're all better for it. So, yeah, th- I think this is that's a great point though because you know, bottom line, don't be buying your oils at Home Goods. You know, if you're out in like. Uh, you know, whatever store that you're shopping at, generally that stuff is not going to be, it's like your supplements, right? Like we talk about this too. It's all sourcing. So if it's cheap and it's at dollar general, or it's at a local grocery store, just kind of like, it's probably not going to be the highest quality. In fact, it probably has a lot of synthetics and it probably has a lot of things in it that are drawbacks for your health. Mm-hmm. So the cost to benefit ratio, plus you're spending money on it. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. So that's why we really love illuminating people that have platforms like yourself, Nadine, because you do a great job educating people, not just, I'm going to sell you a product. It's like, I need you to, I want you to understand this so that mm-hmm. you can make educated choices for yourself because we're all out there trying to find solutions to the problems that we're facing. And many of us are spending an exorbitant amount of resources. I mean, what I tell you, the amount of women, their regimens and routines to try and not have a wrinkle would blow your mind. And I'm not even saying that in a judgmental way, like I'm with you. I'm also not trying to age any faster. However, I don't want to have to subscribe to all of these different treatments you know, to, to try and like preserve my face. Oh, yeah. like, so what, what, what what's I, going on with all of this? I would that's love what I feel I sort of been my uh, raison d'etre sort of when I'm just like going into an area of the body mm-hmm. because I'm not into like 10 step programs either. I want to figure out where, what's the optimal situation. What do I, and sort of stand back and go and know that the body is so intelligent and we haven't even, like crack that code, ba- ba- like barely on the body's intelligence. And so I like to stand back and, and be like, well, what if I'm not interfering with the system? What do I do to get my body doing the work of the beautifying and the cell renew? You know what I mean? Rather mm-hmm. than just at the hands of my own application of another bottle of cream. So, so that's what I'm looking at, whether it's like, how are we going to have the mouse come in balance or the skin. And then that really leads to like, oh, well, we got to have bacteria and a microbiome on the skin. You know what I mean? So I'm trying to find out those things so that we don't have to have 10 steps to wash our face. And that's where I feel like the gold is because I don't want a lifetime of appointments and all that stuff either. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. So what is, if somebody 
say they have inflamed skin, meaning like they're, they've got breakouts or maybe they're hormonal breakouts. Maybe there's just discoloration and sunspots and they feel like their face is puffy. They probably have poor lymphatics, like just different things going on. What's a step-by-step process of like how, I mean, I realize there are probably a million different ways to skin the cat here. And a lot of it would depend on the specific variables, but what would you generally recommend? Because a lot of times people are thinking, oh, the skin is so dirty. My pores are so clogged. Let's wash and scrub with soap. Let's exfoliate. Let's just try to like get down to a healthy layer of skin. Whereas your approach is saying, oh no, like we're, that literally is disrupting the tools that we need, the microbiome that we need to rebuild healthy skin. So yeah. Because I think that's a big, that is a huge hang up. Like everybody thinks like our skin's dirty. We need to scrub it and clean it. So yeah. what's, what is your approach to that against what kind of like the near, the general approach of trying to cleanse our skin? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, obviously I'm a big believer in like what's going in on and around the body, but I am always like so thankful and it's pretty amazing what a f- changing a few things for skincare without even changing the diet for Mm. many people can often just be the solution, which is great because it's a lot easier to just wash your face differently than thinking of a whole new diet. Mm. Um, And so one of the main things for skin or like the first foundational step is to stop washing with soap or any of the little variations, the foaming cleansers, the gentle foaming cleansers, the blah, 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 the microplastic exfoliating beads, all that it's just mm-hmm. got to go and you want to take it back to the ancient practice of washing your face with oil mm-hmm. which sounds crazy especially if people have had like cystic acne for 20 years um, but you want to stop in my book there's a few I talk about stop seal and, and seed and you can do that with a few areas of the body but for mm-hmm. so for example with the face you want to stop you know using those things and then you're just using either like a c- organic cotton pad um, with a spot of water, a, a squeeze of oil, and you're washing your face that way, you would then rinse and then just one more uh, squirt of oil could be could be it. You don't even need to move on to other serums. So that's great for men and women, teens, everybody. Mm-hmm. And um, this skin will really come back into balance through that. You're going to see improvement right away mm-hmm. within the first like 24, 48 hours. Um so depending on the skin, obviously, if it's like cystic acne for a couple decades, that might take a couple months to turn around, but people are seeing improvement um, right away. Rarely, I'd say like maybe like 5% of the time, there's a bit of a detox cleanse because now that you've stopped just for some people, sort of more stuff comes out. So just for a small percent of the population that kind of have to ride through a bit of that but that's literally it just calms everything right down resets because everything else that we've been told to do for our skin is putting us in this catch-22 cycle that's really hard for people to get out of if there's any kind of uh you know imbalance with the skin Mm. so that's really important because what we know now too with studying the microbiome and and the stratum corneum which is the very top layer of the skin Mm -hmm. there's the epidermis which is just like a millimeter thin So that Mm -hmm. then, you know, there's all our, there's the dermis and everything, but that top layer, there's five layers and that top layer, the stratum corneum, what happens now that we see was surfactants, which can be, you know, your sodium lauryl sulfate family. There's about 50, 50 different names for that. Anyway, um, microscopic splinters are, are lodged into the stratum corneum and they don't go away with rinsing. So Mm. you get this daily buildup that may manifest as melasma hyperpigmentation, eczema, just some dry patch, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's not helping your lipid barrier, which is something you want to keep in with integrity because that helps us to anti-age or to not age as fast. And then um, we're also over exfoliating way too much. And when we do that, we're leaving the young cells underneath coming up from the basal layer Mm-hmm. way too vulnerable they're like being put on center stage before their time mm-hmm. and it's kind of like leaving the front door open while you're on vacation with that if we're over exfoliating over exfoliating our face too much wow. um with the best with using oil we've made um 
a, a few of they're called best skin ever and these are the ones you can use like however you want you know men women put on your hair massage cleanse your face you can use it as a body oil um so those I forgot where I was going to go now um but you want to use those to just just be gentle and then you can use like just a classic you can use that cotton pad I suggested or just like a terry like a face cloth just like a classic face cloth that, you know, that terry texture, mm -hmm. that with the oil and water, that's enough for daily exfoliation. Just that light buffing that the, the terry cloth does, you know, or if you want a little extra exfoliation, you can add just a pinch of baking soda, which mm -hmm. is, you know, very fine. And you could do that as well. And the baking soda will be good for every day too, with the oil when you put that on the, the cloth. Yeah, too. although you won't, I don't think you're going to need it every day, but it would certainly be okay to use every day. And mm -hmm. also even like when you're switching shampoo, hopefully getting off something that's with the sodium oil sulfate and stuff, you can use uh, baking soda in the first few shampooings to also cleanse um, all that buildup on the scalp from other, other uh, shampoos. There's mm -hmm. so many weird things in shampoos and conditioner. And when we don't have a clear scalp, that can lead to, you know, shedding um, and all the way to male pattern baldness, because what happens is the scalp gets uh, just too congested. And then the pores mm -hmm. get smaller and smaller, and then they're choking out the hair right so that the hair gets thinner and then eventually choked out now it's a deeper thing it could be not converting your dihydroxy i mean the the testosterone the dht, DHT. Mm -hmm. uh, um, or other hormonal things but you've got to you know which you can have a deeper look at but you've got to make sure that the conditions sort of the soil of the scalp are in good shape which also again you know if you've got tap water you'd want to have a uh, filter Mm -hmm. which is, you know, easy to get these days. It doesn't have to be mega, um, but just, you know, under $30, you can get a shower filter because uh, chlorine is really disturbing to the microbiome mm -hmm. of the scalp and body. So you want to be able to give your, your hair a chance that way as well. And we're kind of at a, having a hair shedding crisis globally right now. <laughs> it seems that the virus has uh, disturbed a lot of people's hair follicles. <laughs> Definitely. So when you have the oils so that you can nourish the scalp, you have the oil on your yeah. website, you have that, that combination, they can go ahead and just find it from there. And you said you could put it in your hair. Do you have a separate product for those thinking about their hair? Like, cause a lot of people are losing their hair. Do you have a separate product for shampoo and conditioner or, or do you just use the oil over do. the hair? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The oil you can use everywhere and it can be, you know, even baby, even like we have specific ones for babies, the Jai Baby Joy, but yeah, within the best skin ever range, you will find, uh, I mean, and we have people saying like, it's the Holy Grail, it's liquid gold. I mean, we have, it's diehard fans there. And yes, we've also made like, uh, we've got two beautiful scalp oils. There's one with pumpkin seed oil and and stinging nettles and, oh, and wow, rosemary, yeah. which is so good for the hair. So that really helps. And you can oil up your hair. I like to, um, you can do it just before you're shampooing, but I like to, if I'm not going anywhere, then I'll take a few days before I'm washing mm -hmm. and I'll just like rosemary and put the crown and glory oil all, you know, into my roots and massage it in and then I'll wash it off. I kind of have these oil days where I'll just like oil up and then rinse. I love that <laughs> oil days. Too. Because, you know, the <laughs> hair is getting too long here. All right, Nadine, I've got oh, yeah, to keep the locks great. going. All right. You know, I keep the locks. Both of you really do have long, like beautiful locks of hair. I'm I'm working on growing mine back out. So <laughs> I, I have write to... a, a pretty, I, sorry to interrupt. I have a, I have a, some hair care articles on the site and stuff in Renegade Beauty, but I'm actually going to be um, writing a new article soon because I feel like I've got some deeper answers on, uh, getting that full head of hair and, and getting clearing up shedding. Yeah, this is what, good. What's, what's your take on this just popped in my head, but you, you see now like all of these people that are into the neutrophil, neutrophil, is that how you say it? Yep. Anyway, it's, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this product, but it's like they're capsules. It's a supplement, but oh. it's essentially supposed to help you grow like these, you know, long luscious locks of hair. And so 
you just see them everywhere and they're not inexpensive. Like they're, they're pretty pricey for what they are, but I've had so many people ask me, Hey, what do you think? Is this going to help with your hair growth? And, you know, I generally don't like jump on the bandwagon or something. that's just like, Hey, take this pill and your hair is going to grow wildly, you know, amazing. I I'm just interested in hearing, you know, uh, uh, any, any well, and all thoughts on that. I would love to look at the label, you know, to yeah. really see, um, Again, it could be a combination where you can easily achieve that through some other, you know, doesn't necessarily have to be that brand. Um, pumpkin seed oil is good, but you can also just take it like you can just take little tablespoons, right? Because it's like, that's yeah. a good thing for the hair. So it doesn't always have to come in a capsule. So yeah, I need to see the ingredients. Um, but yeah, you want basic nutrition for your hair and you have to see if there's underlying hormonal issues, thyroid's a big one, the DHT is a big one. And so those might not necessarily be cleared up by herbs that are good, herbs and vitamins mm. that are good for hair. So you're going to want to check that out. You definitely need the scalp to be the soil, you know, to be that in good condition, which a vitamin ne won't necessarily fix either. Okay. So, mm. Yeah. I like the well, combination. That, yeah. That's great. That, it's a really yeah. good way to think about it. Cause now, you know, it's, it's one of those like it's kind of like a feedback loop of where, you know, you're, if you start treating, if you start removing first, a lot of things that have these phthalates mm -hmm. and chemicals, and they're very disruptive to s pretty much every organ system of your body. Right. Because now your, your, yeah. your detoxification organs, like your microbiome, like everything, immune system, all of that stuff gets affected. So you remove that and then you replace it with things that help nourish these different organ systems. And then you start to restore energy to things like your thyroid. So it's almost like you kind of have to start piecing the puzzle together. One thing isn't ever going to fix anything, but it does have this like domino effect where it triggers something else to start working mm -hmm. or, or optimizing the function of, yes. and then you start to see yeah. the symptoms resolve. That's really, that's kind of a, a, a really cool thing. And I love, I, we, I mean, we talk about this on all of our episodes, like finding these swaps. What, what's totally. like a non-negotiable for you when it comes to your own skincare regimen? What is it that's like, this will always be the cornerstone piece or a foundation piece of, of a practice that I do? sun and oil mm. sun for sure yeah okay like date like sun outside Daily sun out, getting yeah. the sun okay sun. how many minutes what do you like to do sun? nadine like do you like to do a Wait, what minutes time? do i do yeah i mean do you like to use oh. be on the sun for so many minutes is there a, like a minimum or you just like just even a few minutes um what's your normal oh, yeah more than a few minutes if it was let's just say it's an ideal day i don't have to work and it's totally sunny all day mm -hmm. then i'll be i'd love to be in the sun from sun up Obviously, it's got to be the warm out, but like sunrise to about nine would be mm -hmm. my first segment. Then I would do a few things and then I'd be back in the sun at like 1030 to one, maybe. And then back in the sun at the end of the day to, you know, take pictures in the magic hour and watch that sunset. That'd be that's ideal. Um, so you've got to build up your solar, your skin. Our skin was designed to engage with the sun's rays. Mm -hmm. absolutely unequivocally for sure we have thousands of vitamin d receptors all over our body and mm -hmm. they need to be brimming with vitamin d and the vitamin d that's created when our skin connects with those solar sunbeams is different than the supplement which is a fat soluble supp supplement and very key mm -hmm. Vitamin D is so key, but then we also need the other kind, which is the water soluble that's made with the interaction of sun and skin, which creates a very healthy form of cholesterol sulfate. And I mean, I mean, you haven't even tapped into like what it's doing in the body or like, you know, it's making antimicrobial peptides, it's engaging catholicidins. It's so essential. And you want to start slowly but surely and start in the spring or whenever that sun is happening for you. We definitely have winter here. We have three months where there is no um, no v violet coming from those rays. So we can still get those beautiful red light all, mm -hmm. all the year like everybody does. And that's why you want to engage in the morning is to get that red light before the UV comes in. And which is why we use you know red light for biohacking and that kind of thing. Because what we... Well, what I now know, which I don't know when we first came to know this, but we make melatonin, as many know, from the pineal gland at night, but that's only about 5% of the story. We actually have a daytime production of melatonin inside the mitochondria, which I find so amazing and mind-blowing. 
And so we need that red light to communicate, to create that intracellular melatonin and melatonin in the mitochondria becomes the body's most potent antioxidant. It's more potent than glutathione. And it's acting in the cell as a coolant for the process of the ATP conversion. So just taking that food and making it into energy. Mm. And no matter how healthy you are, there is uh, there's like uh, byproducts from that, right? So that those are the free radicals and the oxidants that are made no matter how healthy you are. And so you want to have that intracellular melatonin to cooling to cool that whole process. So that's what the red light does in the day or that early that earlier time of the day sun exposure. And that's so key to our health and beauty. And so you want to build up your solar skin, so to speak, so that you can, uh, you know, by the time it's July, you're not needing uh, sunscreen, per se, hopefully, because you've built up your melanin and you've got your own base layer going. And so that's really key. And what's aging us, of course, we don't want to get burnt, but we really need to learn how to work with the sun because it's so nuanced. Like you could say 20 minutes a day, but that's not going to get your vitamin D going. And is that 20 minutes at like, you know, nine o'clock because there's no UV at that time anyway. And then our modern approach, A, it's lost all nuance. It's kind of like saying, oh my God, people can drown in water. So nobody goes swimming. It's like, this is where we're at now. It's like, you know, you got to wear SPF 50 if you're like going from your car to the mall. Mm -hmm. You cannot have a solar ray touch your skin or we will melt and, you know, be a bunch of moles. And that's not true. It's like, what are we bringing to the sun? Of course, we don't want to be engaging in sunbathing if we're like, you know, drinking Coca-Cola all day and basically using the equivalent of Pam as like a spray on uh, tanning oil, um, because that is going to be cooked into our skin as well. And then with sunscreen, it's so upside down because not only do we have these chemicals that we now know create, you know, endocrine disruptors, liver issues, fertility issues. Um, what's happening when we use sunscreen is that we're now receiving the sun's rays divided. So UVB doesn't come in to the picture and now we're just getting UVA and UVA on its own is sun damaging and we're not getting any UVB, which has the vitamin D connection. So there's mm. no point in sunbathing at that point, right? Yeah. Cause it's to get that engagement. Um, and when we look at like in my book, I have many studies, but like the Cochrane review, which, which they go in and look at many studies and then kind of make a one study out of uh, many studies. So they, I think they pulled about 14 studies on the sun and, you know, generally the conclusion was the more use of sunscreen, the more moles, freckles and skin dysbiosis that happens, you know, then we've got other studies that show the closer you live to the equator, the more you're outside in recreational time, the less chance you have of developing melanoma. And then there's a study coming out, it was in the Lancet, and it was in the 90s. So before we were all in front of computer screens all day and it was saying that you know the biggest issue with skin dys dysbiosis is exposure to fluorescent lighting wow so the sun's really not the issue but it is it's a powerful thing and we there's nuance to engaging with it and that's what we want to understand how to learn to live with the sun use the times of the day to actually work beneficially with the sun and not try to yeah try to say the sun is bad because we've learned how to filter out the beneficial effects of the sun because exactly. we haven't learned how to you work with it basically yeah. that's that's great or if i don't have that much time i might actually pop out i want to pop out at noon sort of noon to one because that's actually when it's the strongest so i have less time i'm going to get that vitamin d going and i try and get my sunbathing in before solar noon mm -hmm. which is usually about one o'clock uh because the daylight saving times that we have everywhere Gotcha. So there's also a good app called DMinder. It's great. And so mm -hmm. you can you plug in your 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 location okay. and then it tells you the sun cycle that day. Well, it does it the whole year. And then you also it gives you a running tab on your D. So what so I can go in the sun for an hour, it will calculate that and I can have like, you know, whatever, a 5000 IU capsule and I can add that in as well because your vitamin D status is mm -hmm. a living thing. Like it will, you need to keep feeding it. Uh, otherwise it, it falls below sufficiency. And when we fall below sufficiency, so many things happen because it's such a gene regulator. 
So mm -hmm. we're talking like cavities can start happening, even TMJ, bruxism. There's so much to do with the mouth and the bones mm -hmm. that needs vitamin D or things start going south. Wow. Yeah. This yeah. is great. I mean, this is... <laughs> So I'm going to look at your website even more because like with all the suggestions, especially with my patients and myself, you know, let me say like, like sun, like anytime I go towards the ocean, I was, I saw Courtney out in Charleston, we had to do a podcast out there. And it's just like you say, being more out in the sun and, and motivating yourself just to have just a bit more sun during the day. And I have some friends that are like, you know, like, I mean, I'm not saying they say don't ever wear sunscreen, but they do believe like, no, I'm going to. You know, they stay out without sunscreen because like we want to train train our skin. And when I first oh, yeah. heard about that, I was like, I don't know about that. Then I started reading more about it. And I was like, that makes sense. So yes, training your skin to actually work with the sun because more and more now, like when I study like even you know, like circadian rhythms, like daily yeah. circadian rhythms, yeah. that's like another thing we need to talk. Like I know we're short on time, but I'm saying like, but still that kind of. Uh, concept within the body and like waking up with the sun or going out and getting the sun to actually help you with your mitochondria. You know, we don't think about that. We're never taught that in science class. So I'm really thankful that you brought this up and your writings teach that too. That's great. Yeah. And there's a pretty, uh, we'll send you um, books if you don't have them, but there's a really a in-depth chapter in Renegade Beauty, but I feel like I could write a whole book on it now and I will, but it'll just, it'll take a moment Oh, because um, there's great. so much to learn. And that circadian rhythm is key. And really the whole, the thesis of um, Renegade Beauty is generally like, you know, do we need to resource ourselves and rejuvenate and, you know, it's not going to come from another bottle or a cream on one level. We need to engage with the elements and that's the general vibe with Renegade Beauty. So how do we tap in? to what the elements are offering. So that's where we have to first sort of get our fuel from the sun, pure water, fresh water, jumping in a lake, an ocean, mm -hmm. having a good bath, um, you know, with a filter on it, or, you know, lying on the earth, beautiful food from the earth, and, you know, the beautiful botanicals from the earth, or like fresh air, forest bathing, moon bathing, earth bathing, sun bathing, 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 we need it all. And that's what will tune, you know, really will revive our beings you know not another mm -hmm. bottle of supplements or whatever i mean that's handy but we got to get to that primary ancient health thing you know that's right that's right so good it isn't is good. it funny dr molly how so many of our guests this year it doesn't matter what their background and their expertise is and it, it's it's not even like a part of like you know any outline that we're going off of but almost every single one has come back to the sun and energy and how yeah. we like how important that piece is to your health. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it, it is like we, they all talk about it too. And I think like we've had guests Nadine that talked about how the sun hits your eyes, you know, and activates certain yeah. activities in your brain and yep. uh, how, it, how you need that to activate your mitochondria. Like you say, the melatonin. Um, yeah. And the and super I, key asthmatic nucleus. Which it's is like that. helping our whole circadian rhythm. Dr. So Laurent's like, thought about that's. I got to uh, study this stuff more. Oh yeah, that makes sense. Oh well, if you've had it, so then yeah, and he's the master of melatonin. Which if you've had him, I'm just here to say like that's such a solution for hair. It was going to be in my article, but like you don't have to put it on topically. But everybody that I've seen take like use his melatonin suppositories. It's just yeah. everything thickens up for everybody. Yep. I'm That's like, one uh, of the key things. I told him, like, I said, can we get some of your products, you know, because I love to, on my, on my, you know, small Instagram feed, I still, I like to advertise those things and just say, you need to check it out. Yeah. I need to get some of the oil because, uh, for the scalp and stuff and for the face, because, um, I have patients ask me all the time about it. And, you know, I'm honestly, I'm not really researching the, the, the quality of brands with oils. So I got to get, I'll contact you and I'll message you. Okay. On, on IG. That'd be great. Thank oh you. man, this has been such this a great, great conversation. Nadine, this is a great convo. This is really good. Yeah, I love this. I want for you to tell everybody where they can find you because you're as as with most of our guests, <laughs> Dr. Molly. You know, here I am, just shopping away. <laughs> yeah, hey, Nadine, but when you see Courtney and she's doing this, she's like, I was trying to write down like some notes, and Courtney's like, "Well, I got that in the cart." I, I really what? do. 
because, okay, you've got stuff for kids. Like there's even th things for um, their oral health. And I'm always looking for ways to help support oh, yeah. the kids, yes. even though, you know, my children do eat very well, but um, there's just a lot of garbage out there for kids, especially. Oh, and, you know, it's, it is crazy. Like so, if it's for kids, let's just make it worse. It seems, right. Let's make it more plasticky. Yeah. All right. So Nadine, time. tell us where everybody can find you to find your resources, your products, everything that we've talked about on today's episode. We've got livinglibations.com, which will take you there. And definitely email us any of your hair, health, beauty questions, dental. We're there to, you know, answer as best we can or send you resources uh, to get you on your way. And we also do consulting for free as well. So that's a great way. And we have, inst you know, all the regular like Instagram and everything. And my books are wherever books are sold, also on our website. And they're both in Audible format as well. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah, your stuff is beautiful too. The way it looks, it's just, it's, the presentation is really good too, Nadine. So, yes. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, guys. We're going to drop everything in the show notes for you, all of the little tidbits and tips and everything that we talked about. So, make sure you grab those links, give Nadine a follow, check out her website, her book. She's got so many resources, like she just described. So, thanks, Dr. Motley, for joining. Nadine, it was such a pleasure to have you today. Such a pleasure to meet you. Yeah. All right, guank guys. We'll see you on the next episode. Yeah.